banking system as we know it today fails, mm -hmm. what will that do to the price of silver and gold? That will then begin to push the price of silver and gold to its true fundamental value. We've been watching the layers of confidence in the system go away. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Yankee Stacking. Whether you're a seasoned gold and silver stacker or just starting your stacking journey, you're gonna love this interview with the one and only Lynette Zhang. I promise you will come out of this video much smarter, uh, much more aware and more determined than ever to stack silver and gold. Lynette is an economist, a former investment banker with like close to 60 years worth of experience, hardcore stacker, passionate prepper. You've probably seen her all over YouTube, like on Kitco News and in Stansberry Research. And now she's on Yankee Stacking. Hi, Yankee. It's good to be here. I am a huge fan. So honored to have you on my channel. Oh. I, I mean it. You've helped so many people uh, wake up to the economic realities of our country, of the world, really. Uh, and, you know, you've also helped a, a lot of people understand the value of gold and silver, real money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, and, we've, it's been taught, <laughs> oh, it, we've been taught not to think of it as value, but yet they're buying it hand over fist, the central banks are. It's hmm. true. I mean, yeah, central banks stack it. They just don't want us to stack it, right? <laughs> Correct. Because whoever has it retains their freedom and their power. I've seen what I think is a tsunami of interest in physical precious metals. My friends, my family, I mean, investors who, Lynette, were just scoffing at the idea of putting a substantial portion of their wealth into gold and silver. They're, they're not really mocking precious metals the same way anymore. Why do you think people are buying gold and silver so much right now? Well, I really think that it has a lot to do with the obvious inflation, because that's when people understand that their currency is losing value when it costs them more and more to buy the things, you know, so if the central banks can keep it at 2%, mm -hmm. they're getting that price stability. In other words, people aren't asking for more wages. Uh, but I think when it, it moves at the level that it, the speed that it's been moving, then that makes people notice that something is going on with the currency. I think that's really it. I love what you said, obvious inflation. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a Austrian economics type of guy. So when I okay. see the central banks printing currency, that is inflation, but it's not always obvious, right? <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, here we go. It kind of depends. <laughs> There's my world famous gun. Love that but, gun. And it, you know, and it, and it depends on where they're holding it. Because since 2008, when they started the quantitative easing and all the money printing, there's, see, this isn't causing inflation, but we saw stock markets, bond markets, and real estate markets. That's where that inflation was being held. So yeah, obvious. In our short attention span and news cycle, it's mm -hmm. like a million years ago now that we saw SVB and you know, Signature Bank go under. Have you ever heard of incident screens? They're popular over in the UK. Have you ever heard I of those? Have not. No. Okay, so they're like screens that they pop up when there's an accident. It hides the problem on the side of the highway and it just keeps the traffic flowing, right? Move along, nothing to see here. I think they've kind of erected a monetary incident screen right now on the economic highway. I mean, that is a really good point. And I, I would agree with that because you're right. We have been taught to go shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter in our attention span. And, you know, when they changed the rules back in 2018, which kind of opened the door to what just happened with those two banks, well, what'd they say in there? They said, well, it's been six years and we haven't had any more incidents. So certainly we can do that again. <laughs> okay. Right. Because if they can manage how you perceive things, then they can manage 
how you move forward. But I like to do just the opposite. I want to show you the truth Mm. from their own data. Mm -hmm. And then if you have a different opinion than I, well, who's to say that your opinion isn't as valid as mine? It is. But here's all the data. Don't take anybody's word for anything. Mm. Good point. I thought it it was amazing, though, Lynette, how quickly the powers that be, you know, determined the systemic importance of the banks, bail out every deposit regardless of size. It was stunningly fast. Oh, yes. Well, you know, look, what happened there and the amount of money that the Fed borrowed from the Treasury to give to the FDIC was 148 billion but the FDIC only has 128 billion which is a, a teeny bit more than a penny for every insured dollar of deposit forget the uninsured but somehow that was going to create a system I mean who even heard of SBB before this not I many know. I know but why was that systemically important I think that what makes somebody systemically important, and this is even listening to our wonderful Janet Yellen, as well as Jay Powell, you know, such smart people, is what's the impact going to be? So when you look at who they bailed out at SBB, well, it was venture capitalists, and it was also um, the technology companies that can help them bring forth the central bank digital currencies. So that's why they were systemically important. Mm -hmm. If you're in a small community bank, are you going to be systemically important? Mm. Look what happened in 2008. Bank failure after bank failure after bank failure. Consolidation, consolidation, consolidation. But those were primarily smaller banks. Mm -hmm. And, and I really am seeing a parallel. It'll be interesting to see this whole thing unfold because this is all just the tip of the iceberg anyway that we're seeing. It's not over, is it? Oh, it's definitely <laughs> not over. Even the IMF came out and said, <laughs> you know, this isn't over yet. Yeah. But no, it's definitely not over. But, but I, do you remember when JP Morgan and their shotgun wedding bailed out Bear Stearns? Right. And then that was supposed to take care of it, but it didn't take care of it. And it didn't become obvious to the public until the following September with the Lehman moment. Right. With the coming banking collapse, Mm -hmm. is it going to be more like a uh, a Cyprus styled bank bail in where not only the bondholders, but the depositors also get left holding the bag? Or is it going to be more like what we're seeing right now, the Fed printing, the FDIC comes to the rescue, bank bailout, where everybody gets made whole. I, I think it's going to look more like Cyprus because even going back to Cyprus, uh, if I have this great graphic, which if you want it, we'll be happy to send to you, where you see the French and the German banks when Cyprus joined the uh, euro, became part of the euro. Uh, that the French and German banks, because they were paying greater interest, just loaded up Mm -hmm. in Cyprus. But in 2012, that's when they started liquidating. So who was left holding the bag? You think they didn't know in 2012 that this was coming? Of course they did. So I think it'll be more like Cyprus because the public is stickier, right? In other words, we aren't going to change so easily. Mm. But the added element that we didn't really have back then that we do have now that they're talking about quite a bit is uh, all of this online banking, making it easier and faster to create a bank run and move and move money. And we just saw that with SVB with both of those banks. And people need to get this. When you put your hard earned money in a bank, they own it. You become a, an unsecured creditor. You're at the end of the line if and when the banking system collapses, right? Correct. And let's expand that a little bit because what have we seen since that happened but money fleeing the smaller community banks, some of it going into the larger banks, but even more of it going into money markets, right? That's right. And what happened in 2008 
where they they froze it and then uh the money market it was the prime fund i think it was the prime fund i can't remember the name yeah. exactly but they halted redemptions then they put in place money market reforms which would call pay fees and gates to prevent that again but then in 2020 they discovered that those fees and gates were not enough so they're putting in place reforms and what they're calling it is swing pricing so that the money markets will determine how much it would cost to liquidate their illiquid assets mm -hmm. and charge you that even 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 if they liquidate those assets that are highly liquid or at least at this point appear highly liquid now so hey you think you've got it at a dollar for dollar but when you go to redeem you'll see a little pop-up that says okay we'll give you 60 cents on the dollar do you still want to go through with this transaction and what will most people do They'll probably say, oh, no, I don't want to pay that fee. Right. So they'll leave their wealth at risk. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's you know, your perception is that this is something safe. And even in the government money market funds, because I think they're really doing their best to reduce global dependence or deposits into the money market funds that fund the foundation of the global system. Mm -hmm. But have we not been hearing about the loss of liquidity in the treasury market, which is the foundation of the global system? And we've been hearing that since 2015. This is not new news. Well, you mentioned the word consolidation earlier. I, I heard mm -hmm. Edward Dowd, uh, the founder of Finance Technologies, a former BlackRock fund manager. He was on Kitco recently. He claimed we could end up with as few as six banks when all said and done. What do you think of that claim? I think it's 100% accurate. And we've been watching that really since the 2000s. So, and and actually there are, there are really not even six now. According to the data, you've got what? JP Morgan, uh, Bank of America. You've got, let's see, JP Morgan, Bank of America, um, what are some of the other? I don't know. You could do <laughs> Citibank, Goldman, Goldman Sachs. Yeah. Citibank. Yeah. Right. Wells Fargo. Well, Wells Fargo. Yep. So we've been in a consolidation mode for a very long time because they changed the rules and the laws that enable that consolidation. A key one was 96, but a key one was also when they modified Reg D in 95 and set up those sweep accounts, mm -hmm. which goes back to what you were talking about earlier. You think it's your money. That's just your perception. Legally, that's not true. We've been told that we are, you know, a reserve economy. So you, you deposit a dollar in the bank and loan out $10, but we've changed to a zero reserve economy. So now banks don't have to hold anything. And when you look at how much income they generate from that speculative trading, which was supposed to be handled in Dodd-Frank, and I haven't heard one entity talk about separating risk-taking banks, Wall Street risk-taking banks from deposit-taking banks, going back to that. But that's the way it was from 1933 to 1996. And the stress tests that they've put uh, in place, yeah. they're a joke. They're not they, testing. They were always a joke. They were always a joke. They don't test for a stagflationary scenario. They don't test for what we just went through. I worked at a bank. Obviously, you're a banking expert. No, you're the expert. I just worked at a bank for a short time. I remember talking to the bank president in his office when I first joined. He looked me in the eye and he said, Yankee, this is a confidence game. And in my mind, when he said that, I thought, this is a con game? Yep. <laughs> my eyes were opened. He said it would take less than a half hour to clear every one of our ATMs out. If there was a run, if the confidence is lost, it's over. And it just gave me yep. goosebumps. It still does, actually, to think that we rely so heavily on this fractional reserve banking system. Yeah, yeah. Ample <laughs> reserve regime. We'll just... We'll just take our little money printing gun and we'll just print as much money as we want. 
I right. mean, isn't that what the central bankers always say? You know, when they trot out, don't you don't have to worry about there's plenty of money in the bank because we'll just print as much as we need. So you can get the money out. You don't have to do that. But how about if you go to do it and they say, nope, what are you going to do? Exactly. And, and how many people, you know, when you brought up earlier that people's eyes are starting to open, I can't tell you because I hear about this all the time, pretty much every day. Somebody went to wire funds and there was the bank was questioning them and they didn't want to wire the funds and they put limitations on how much they could wire. And and this and they ask you, money. what are you using this money for? It's none of their business. I know, right? When the banking system as we know it today fails, mm -hmm. what will that do to the price of silver and gold? That will then begin to push the price of silver and gold to its true fundamental value. That's what always happens because this is indeed a con game. That man was absolutely correct about that. And when all confidence is lost and there's, you know, I've been watching the layers of confidence in the system go away. In 2008, it was bank to bank confidence at interbank lending, gone. Banks didn't lend to each other anymore. Then in 2015, it was central bank to central bank with the Swiss surprise where they had made this overt and very vocal commitment to maintaining a peg to the Swiss franc to the euro dollar. And, and two days after they came out and said, this is our highest priority, boom, they removed that peg. That was the Swiss surprise. So it was central bank to central bank. And last August, not even a year ago, when the central bank, using its forward guidance, which is, was a key tool, the banks, the central bank was going to tell the banks everything that they're doing so that the banks on Wall Street could get into position and benefit from this. And they kept saying, you know, that we were going to do 50 basis point move on interest rates, 50 basis points, 50 basis points, and then ba bam, they did 75. So Wall Street knows that they can no longer have confidence that the central bank will do what they're telling them that they're going to do. That only leaves one layer of confidence and rapid inflation erodes that confidence. That's why it's so critically important for them to get a handle on that again. Okay, we're just getting warmed up. When you buy gold and silver, that is when you are actually taking your wealth out of the system. I'm I'm 100% certain. I'm a gazillion percent certain. Here's why we are at the end. Make sure that you are subscribed to my channel and you hit that bell icon as well so that you don't miss part two. It's going to be really exciting. Until next time, I hope your day is A-OK. -okay.